Welcome to the Horror Hotel legal section. Um, my name is Mary Ellen Tomasic. I'm an attorney licensed in Ohio and working in Cleveland with uh, independent filmmakers. As I was uh, mentioning before, um, I had worked with bands and musicians for many years as far as helping them with their contracts and reviewing their contracts with recording company, record companies, and um, helping them with their intellectual property uh, concerns such as uh, copyright, not as much trademark, although uh, trademark has become a big thing in um, some popular music these days. But um, in 1998, I met Johnny Wu, and he um, got me started on one of his original movies here, um, doing the uh, releases for the people who worked on the movie and also extras and people who are just going to be uh, filmed. Um, <clears throat> so you've got your crew and also the people that are just having their images um, uh, being shown in the movie. And the reason I mention that and emphasize that is because um, even all these years later, it seems like uh, some of the contracts for um, people in the movie uh, can get overlooked <laughs> can get uh, given short shrift, and um, I have a case today from New York, which um, came out in September of last year that, uh, from the Ninth Circuit that clarifies uh, some of the materials that um, could be considered copyrightable. Um, and you say, well, any work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium is copyrightable as far as Sending it into the copyright office, being able to um, being able to uh, register that particular piece of authorship, whether it be a book, screenplay, movie, um, piece of music, anything like that. This case um, out of New York is a uh, cautionary tale, and it actually uh, contains some. Um, some things that happened in a movie that I was involved in. Um, so it is something that you have to really watch for. Uh, this case is called uh, 16 Casa Deuce LLC versus Alex Merkin. Um, it's a producer suing a director over the copyright ownership of parts of and the whole movie. Um, the reason it's so interesting and um, pertinent to independent filmmakers is that this guy um, bought all the rights to the movie, he, um, the producer did, he bought the screenplay, he hired uh, approximately 30 people, uh, two co-producers, a director, script supervisor, director of photography, two assistant cameramen, a production designer, costume, all kinds of people. Everybody that worked on the movie, sound and lighting technicians and actors. Um, every member of the cast and crew executed an agreement with the plaintiff assigning all their work and the results of all their work on the movie to the producer and the production company to put the film together. Um, and this director would not sign this agreement. Um, it's a long and involved case because of the recalcitrance of this guy, the director's lawyer, who didn't know anything about copyright and kept arguing things that uh, had no basis in fact. Um, it was interesting because the judge really did um, chastise and um, try to explain why uh, this director's actions were so uh, egregious. Um, pardon me. So anyway, um, he tried to get the director to sign this agreement for the longest time. And everybody else had signed, and they were getting to eight days left before the filming and the rehearsal and everything was supposed to start in the production. Um, the director was unresponsive to this. They started up the film, making the film, and he started directing, and everything was okay uh, as far as when they first started the film. Um, it says, uh, they proceeded to direct the film without incident. Um, the original characterization in these contracts for everybody was, 
or for hire. They didn't own any part of the movie, and any of the work that they did that was incorporated into the movie was now assigned to um, the production company. So this director got the idea that his directing, um, his actual directing, including his lens choices, camera angles, and such, were a copyrightable thing in themselves. Um, the other side in, in the lawsuit tried to explain to this guy's lawyer that um, the essence of copyrightability is that the work of authorship is fixed in a tangible medium, be it in a movie, in a, you know, in a screenplay written down, um, you know, in a book, and things like that. A directing by itself is not a thing that can be put together in a copyrightable way, except in the movie itself. This guy, um, it's kind of weird because his lawyer is arguing that he owned part of the movie, and the court took a long time to explain why that he did not, and part of the um, things that is a takeaway for you people is that um, A, until it's fixed in a tangible medium, no kind of creative authorship such as, um, you know, the directing, the, um, uh, any kind of lighting and all the stuff that the other people did, even the actors, their creative component was not copyrightable until it was incorporated into the fixed movie. So the court tried to tell the, um, the director that his, you know, that, that his lawyer was arguing for rights that had no existence. Uh, so um, of course it was the nightmare where um, the director was given a hard drive with uh, portions of the movie on it and he was supposed to um, edit the movie, and uh, since they hadn't signed that agreement, they saw, tried to sign another agreement um, that um, just had to do with the editing of the movie, but um, I think he didn't sign that one either. So, um, what the problem is that the, mo the movie got finished, and the producer had already begun the process of trying to get it into film festivals, and. He was going to have a big opening in New York um, at the New York Film Academy, and he had, you know, um, reserved a place to have a reception and everything like that. And uh, this new this uh, director held up the entire movie, saying that until he signed off on his directing um, authorship, then they couldn't uh, run the movie because he got in his idea about some kind of chain of title now. When I read this case, I think that perhaps this lawyer was a little bit taken in by some um, myths and urban legends having to do with copyright. So uh, it's really unusual to have this kind of thing where the guy didn't go out and get an intellectual property attorney. He uh, got some guy that did not know um, about stuff. And the problem is he kept um, trying to get um, temporary restraining orders against the movie, and he went and um, uh, registered the movie for uh, copyright in the copyright office without telling the producer who actually owned the movie. Um, it was all based on um, all the authorship was consolidated by these agreements in the producer. Okay, so you're not talking about copyrightable pieces of the movie being put together. You're talking about authorship of creative things being put together in a medium, the movie, all being owned by this producer. This director was trying to say that he had a copyrightable right to his directing and they couldn't put out the movie without him signing off on it, which was not true. So, um... Admit it. You're the one who killed him. You seduced him. Gained his confidence. And then when he wasn't looking, you reached into your purse, and without conscience or remorse, you pulled out a gun and shot him. And cut. Curious? Visit theindiegathering.com, a film festival, and so much more. In today's world, there is an absolute need to know how to protect yourself. 
But who has the time or money for lengthy training sessions with techniques you may not remember in a time of need or which can wind up putting you in even more danger? With Escape and Survive, you will learn effective, easy to remember techniques for getting out of dangerous situations. No complicated moves, no expensive, time consuming training, just common sense self defense. Book your seminar today at escapeandsurvive.com. Actually, it's funny because um, at the beginning, the, 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 uh, the producer actually said that he assumed that um, they agreed to produce, uh, they proceed with the filming without a signed agreement, believing that Merkin had agreed in principle that his services would be a work for hire and that the producer would have final editorial control over the film, final cut authority. Um, and he did not raise any objections or have any additions to the draft agreement after he got it. So basically they gave him the agreement, he said he was going to have his lawyer over it, and um, he never ended up signing it, but he didn't offer any kind of counter agreement. So in other words, when you, you know, they, they don't mention it as much in here because it's a straight copyright case, but um, Aside from something that has to be in writing, these types of agreements don't necessarily have to be in writing, but you'd have to be an idiot not to get them in writing because, as you can see, they argued this out in a 16-page court case, which is on appeal to the Court of Appeals of New York. So, um, it's very expensive not to have these things set out ahead of time, um, which is some of the Some of the advice that I would give all filmmakers, um, have all your contracts together. They tried it, they were, you know, trying to get the movie started and figured that he would sign it in between and um, he never did. He came up with this cockamamie idea that he owned part of the copyright to it. So um, it's kind of an unusual agreement. I mean, it's, a, it's an unusual, um, you know, case that this guy, he never said um, that kind of understood it was to be a work for hire and he never argued that it wasn't and after that um, so um, so they missed the film festival and they lost the deposit on the reception and so that was all part of his damages when the um, uh, when the court decided in uh, the producer's favor um, Again, uh, under the copyright law, as far as infringement goes, um, the court found that the producer was the sole author of the film. Even if this director had not signed his agreement and maybe was had some authorship, um, you know, that he was going to put him in the film, it was a work for hire, and it wasn't anything that he was going to be able to own by himself without being part of the authorship of the movie, which the authorship of the movie was all consolidated into this one guy because of all the um, um, agreements that he made with the cast and crew. So the court had no problem um, deciding that, you know, out of 30 people the director didn't sign, the director didn't have any 
special rights to anything aside from what's being put in the movie. So um, they decided that the entire authorship was in the, the and it was in the producer, and so he could um, exploit the movie on his own and stop this guy from um, from uh, registering the movie for copyright and everything. So um, it's so funny how the court really chastises this other lawyer. Um, the court had no difficulty finding that the uh, the plaintiff is entitled to summary judgment, which means they don't even have a term. You know, they on the pleadings themselves, the stuff that they say, he's, it's obviously he's going to find for the other guy. Um, invalidating uh, the director's copyright registration um, under New York law, they um, had some um, breach of contract and conversion for keeping. The hard drive, they allowed them to, an injunction to get the hard drive back. Um, and they specified that not only the hard drive, but the value comes from its contents. So they, the court specified the return of the hard drive's contents and any copies made of its contents, you know, of the movie. So um, this really brings home um, the difficulty of suing somebody when this kind of thing happens. Um, I was involved in a movie where the same exact thing happened. The director did not sign his agreement. Um, the agreement I made that I, I drafted for uh, the producers, I was doing some work for them. Um, they couldn't get the guy to sign it. Couldn't get it, couldn't get it, but he had the hard drive too. And eventually they made a settlement that uh, they were going to reshoot parts of the movie and um, some of that footage was going to be lost and not used. And, you know, so it was, it was a big mess. But. Um, in this case, um, they awarded some sanctions and attorney's fees and costs to um, the producer because um, this guy had an independent film. He didn't have a gigantic film. And there wasn't going to be all that much um, damages as far as trying to exploit the film or anything like that. Um, but he had to, the other party was so unreasonable in his uh, part of the litigation that they ordered um, attorney's fees and costs and they got back the money for the reception. Um, the, uh, the court said that the justification for a fee award is especially strong here because the financial amount at stake between the parties is quite small, but with, and so without the prospect of a fee award, um, the injured party might be forced into a nuisance settlement or deterred altogether from enforcing his rights. Most people can't even go into court to try to um, go against somebody like this. So, um, and not everybody is as litigious as this, obviously. You know, um, this was a very extreme case, but it shows that guys won't sign stuff. It could turn into problems when you're trying to argue um, what kind of rights he's being given. Now. Um, as far as the standard director agreement that I worked up, it does have two different parts talking about um, who owns parts of the film and what kind of work it is, a work for hire. Um, this is as opposed to the director having final cut, right? So there's an implicit understanding the director does not have final cut, is that correct? Right, well, right. as far as the agreement that they had in the case, sure. It was like no final cut, everything was to the producer. And so this guy was aware of what the intent, and you know, I didn't want to get into it, but there was a lot about the intent of the producer and the parties. And, but you see, the reason that the court had to go through all this intent stuff was because they didn't have the contract down on the barrel, you know. Um, and as I said, you know, some of these things outside, you know, if, uh, a contract like this, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in writing because if the filming doesn't go over a year, it doesn't get in trouble with the statute of frauds of Ohio, which is something where it tells what kind of contracts have to be in writing, real estate, you know, um, something not to be completed within a year. For some reason, they had that cut off. So, uh, conceivably, if it got done within a year, and this guy also was going to be paid um, $1,500 for his directing. Uh, work and it was a work for hire according to the contract. Everybody knew what it was intended to be, and the director couldn't argue that hey, they weren't paying me, so I was supposed to get rights. No, he got a straight payment just like everybody else. So, um, but anyway, so here's the uh, 
Here's an, ex here's an example of a uh, ownership of rights clause uh, for a director that I had worked up. And this is partially, I, you know, the, the faster technology goes, the more you have to add into these contracts because, um, you know, even 10 years ago, we, there wasn't as much um, live streaming online or, um, you know, mobile devices showing films or, you know, I mean, you can even argue ringtones for music and stuff like that. And that's not your regular thing that's included. So you can have like an omnibus type clause talking about, um, you know, um, all, you know, um, any means or media in existence or to be, you know, discovered or invented later. But I like to give examples of what those things might be because um, I think. Uh, as long as you put that clause in and you then give examples of what you're talking about, um, there, can, there can't be any, any question. Okay, so <clears throat> ownership of rights. In addition to director services as a director, production company shall be entitled to and shall own all the results and proceeds thereof, and shall own all rights in the picture, the component parts thereof. That's what I was talking about before, component parts. You know, the all the stuff that has been given to people. Now, there can be component parts that are actually copyrightable in themselves. Like, for example, if somebody does a, um, a piece that is a special effect, that they're going to execute, film, you know, record, do whatever they're going to do, and then they give it to the producer of the film and he incorporates it into the film. It's already in something. It's already in a fixed medium. You can actually take it and, you know, use it for something, conceivably. Welcome to Movie Outline 3, your first step to a successful screenplay. Movie Outline is powerful screenplay development software for both the amateur and the professional screenwriter, which uses the simple technique of step outlining to build your story, characters, and screenplay scene by scene. With Movie Outline, you can easily plan and customize your story structure, color code acts, rearrange scenes, develop and track characters, format your screenplay, and compare your own story to successful Hollywood movies. Movie Outline is the ultimate writer's tool. Whether you're a novice or professional screenwriter, Movie Outline has a host of features to suit your needs, enabling you to plan your story and present your polished screenplay to a professional standard. Don't miss out on the most powerful screenwriting tool available. Visit www.movieoutline.com to download the free demo today. Are you a filmmaker looking for the location of your next project? Contact the North Coast Film Commission. With small cities throughout Ohio, we're here to help with your film, television, and commercial productions. With low to no cost permits and locations, we'll help stretch your budget. From our production resources to our talent database, we will show you just what the North Coast has to offer. Visit NorthCoastFilmCommission.com today. Um, so that's a little bit of a different thing because you've already got it in now. Query weather makeup, you know. Um, yeah, you can take a picture of the makeup style and everything and you could possibly, um, but you can 
see the difficulty in that. You know, then you're not talking about you know makeup for a, for a film. You're talking about a photograph. So um, that again is incorporated into the film. Now you know makeup artists want to make a deal with somebody where they're like such a great special effects makeup artist that they could get a piece of the film. But ordinarily, it's a full work for hire type uh, situation. So um, <clears throat> and um, only now can uh, things like that be fixed in a medium if you. Um, think about choreography. Um, the copyright office struggled for years to try to figure out how to fix that in a medium. And they finally decided, you know, a recorded, you know, film of it was okay. But I mean, and then they have like a um, a thing that tells the dance steps. And that's that's like the worst example um, of trying to get something that's you know into a copyrightable medium. So anyway, he doesn't own any of the rights to the picture the producer does. All the components there, parts thereof, and the copyright for use throughout the world in perpetuity, including but not limited to all rights throughout the world of production, public performance, manufacture, television, recordation, and reproduction by any art, method, or media, whether now known or hereafter devised, um, and also copyright, trademark, and patent rights. Uh, whether such results and proceeds consists of literary, dramatic, musical, motion pictures, they're getting all the copyrightable elements into it in case. You know, so in case there are any copyrightable elements like um, um, creations of um, special effects or something, they're now assigning that all to the producer right here. Um, so, um, so they have now been assigned to everybody or to uh, the, the producer of anything that they create during the film. Um, interestingly, uh, some of these films, uh, I've seen cases where a comedian is in a film, right? So he's got a particular bit, you know, and maybe he's not that known yet or whatever. He gets in the film, the bit gets really known, boom, he can't use a bit anymore. It's all by the, the picture. Now, if he had really high bargaining rights, you know, he could, you know, a guy now, a well-known comedian, obviously, could retain a lot of the ownership of that, but um, you know that's that's maybe an extra thing for a producer who puts up a lot of money for film and all of a sudden gets a, a bonus of you know owning some kind of bit. But that's just so um, they can't exploit it outside the movie and acting like you know they own part of the movie. You know, it's, it's a connection like that. Um, they want to be owned by the movie, so they don't have to worry about it. What if the comedian doesn't like the depiction of his bit? Can he then sue the producer? You know, so they don't want that happening. Um, the other um, common, and this is in the same contract, um, the work for hire clause. Uh, reiterating again, production, production company shall be the owner of all the results and proceeds of a director's services, including any copyright, trademark, and any other intellectual property rights, in any work or property created by the director or anyone under the director's direction. The director acknowledges that directors, this is the director contract, this is why they're mentioning him. Um, director acknowledges that director's work is a work for hire and within the scope of director's engagement and therefore production company shall be the author and copyright owner of any work created under this agreement. In the event that any of the proceeds of the director's work are not considered a work for hire, then director's copyright to such work is hereby assigned to the production company. So they're covering all angles. This is the kind of thing that this guy wouldn't assign in the case. But he ended up having to pay a lot of uh, attorney fees and costs and things like that. So um, uh, it's 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 worth getting. You know, we tried to reduce this this director. He had some back end um, compensation also, but that kind of situation didn't work. So he got his money for directing, and then um, you know wouldn't wouldn't sign this. But you know the the terms of the the money terms were there. But for some odd reason, you know, he argued that um, he wanted his main name, he, he wanted to change the film to wait the way he wanted it. So you're, you're going to come up with stuff like that sometimes. Um, so anyway, that's my cautionary tale as far as this case goes. It's a New York case. I can give you the uh, site of it if you'd like. It's actually, um, there's a slip copy available only right now for some reason. This, this imbecile might be appealing it again, I don't know. So, um, 
But anyway, um, contracts, copyrights and trademarks, um, these are the kind of things that you're looking to um, make sure you have done and clear in your films. Um, everybody knows that um, if you have a piece of music in your film, it's going to probably be very expensive to license it if it's even licensable. Um, when you have a changing or use of a piece of, of music like that, that is a synchronization license, as you know. Um, you're taking the music and connecting it up with the film in the way you want. Um, that requires a license from the actual copyright owner, uh, whether it be a, uh, probably usually a record company. Some of these things are very difficult to get, so that's why, uh, and be very, very expensive for the few quote-unquote needle drops that you might use for your film. Um, so that's, you know, every time I talk at one of these, I have to give the bad news to the filmmakers and what kind of stuff they can't use. And, um, you know, um, I had, um, in previous years, um, previous years and also in a paper written on my on my website, which if anybody wants to look at any of the articles I've written on the website, um, you can uh, take one of these cards up here, or I'll, I'll give you the website address, um, www, for the camera, www.met-iplaw.com. Um, I've written up a lot of the lectures that I've done over the years at these functions and at the uh, Indie Gathering. Um, how to obtain, legally obtain music for your film. Um, Trademarks in your film and logos, um, business organizations for films and things like that, because those are the things that I most get asked about. But um, I had written a part in the legal opinion music for your film, talking about well, there's a question whether pre-1972 recordings, recordings um, of music, are not co covered by the copyright law. So can we use those if we can prove that we're using the 19, you know, 71, you know, record album of this particular tune and not the remixed and remastered CD that came out in 2001, for example. So that's a proof problem there, and I think I left it at that, but um, a case out of California came through suing Sirius Satellite Radio for their channels having to do with what? 60s on 6, 70s on 7, where do you think they're getting some of that stuff? Uh, the guys in the Turtles um, sued Sirius for uh, the use and for back royalties for a lot of their tunes that go on 60s on 6 channel because they were pre-1972 recordings um, is the argument that Sirius uh, gives. Um, as you know, the Turtles and the other people in jo that joined in the suit were in California. California does give um, state contract rights, or uh, state common law copyright rights. Well, you can't really say copyright, but um, for things that aren't covered under the federal copyright laws, um, some states have laws that will cover these type of situations um, for music or other material that's not covered by the copyright law for whatever reason. Uh, it's a B movie from the 50s that they didn't renew, so it's in the public domain, or it's pre-1972 music that doesn't uh, have a copyright. Um, that loophole got changed in 1972. You now see the copyright symbol and the P within the circle uh, indicating a uh, um, rights to a recording. Um, so anyway, now it's up in the air whether anybody could legitimately use um, pre-1972 recordings. Also, part of the big Supreme Court case from a couple of years ago that took a lot of stuff out of the public domain because of um, the United States in that country didn't have a treaty at the time. Um, some stuff from Germany, some stuff from Russia um, has now been given the remainder of their copyright term um, so the 1972, pre-1972 recordings were in that category. So now they can be protected under federal copyright. So 
Um, it's up in the air whether you can do that now. You two have disrupted my classroom for the last time. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Spank us? She can't spank us. It's against the law. Spanking would be too easy. I want to cause more permanent. And cut. Curious? Visit theindiegathering.com, a film festival, and so much more. Introducing SoundForge Pro Mac, a two track audio editor reinvented by Mac users for Mac users, redesigned specifically for OS X. SoundForge Pro Mac features an elegantly refined interface. See everything at once or toggle the view to see only the features you need. Record and edit high-resolution multi-channel audio with speed and precision. Process audio with a wide range of unique and powerful tools. Sony Creative Software now brings its industry-leading expertise and innovative product development philosophy to the Mac. SoundForge Pro Mac enhances your production workflow. It's the ideal complement to any digital audio workstation or non-linear editing environment. Redefining audio editing, SoundForge Pro Mac. or royalty-free music, which, uh, as you might know, is an upfront payment and no royalties later. So um, you don't, uh, the, the um, person who sells you that CD or whatever um, doesn't retain a royalty right for that. So that, you know, it's a, a big payment upfront, but um, you can use it to your heart's content. So uh, that's some of the um, things that you can do to work around those very difficult requirements. Um, so anyway, that kind of uh, information is at my website, and you can go and I, you know, I hate to reiterate all the stuff there, but um, does anybody um, have any particular questions or anything having to do with anything in legal issues and films that I can uh, work around? Yeah. Yes, sir. And um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, since you're only one, I'd like if you repeat the question, so it's mm -hmm. not take. But, um, so you've, you've talked about some of the uh, arrangements that a director or you know maybe an actor could have with a production company. Um, could you could you just uh, identify the, the, the basic types? You know, could, you know what, what, when you would get maybe a royalty and what that's called, and mm -hmm. when you're just working for a per hour payment and you know right. that kind of thing. The gentleman wants to know um, what kind of arrangements can you make with um, different people that are involved with the film and um, what kind of payments can you make for them? Um, am I characterizing yes. Um As we know, a lot of times, um, you have to resort down to basic contract law for some of these independent films. Um, something of some sort of value on one side, something of some sort of value on the other side. They don't have to be equal. They can be, and I know um, I'm not telling tales out of school to tell you that over the years, Johnny Wu and people like that have um, have used um, on the one side, you know, maybe somebody isn't getting paid um, up front. Um, they'll often have some um, back end rights if you know all this stuff is paid, then you get a percentage or something. Um, I believe this particular contract for the director had that, um, and, that, and that just depends on what kind of bargaining 
power that the director or the actor, you know, if you have a really like a SAG actor, um, you may want to have them have the possibility of getting some money down the line, so you can throw that in. But for, for most of these, nobody gets paid anything. But you know, so anyway, if you've got a situation where you're um, hiring somebody to do work, but they're doing it maybe for the promise of some back-end money later, or getting paid if everybody gets paid, or you know, if all the debts are paid off in the film, or for their own training and um, you know, credit. Credit is a big thing. Now that we have IMDb, um, you can have your own page, any kind of, you know, that's where I think a lot of people, um, you know, don't value that as much as they should. Yeah, everybody wants to make a living off of films, music, and everything like that, but um, having something out there with your name, having something with credit can bootstrap you to other things. As the film commissioner always says, I have a Schwartz, <clears throat> what they want on films is people have worked on films before. They, you know, yeah, you can, except for stuff like electrical and things like that, you know, you can say like, I went to film school and everything. What's well, like, no, but did you work on a, as a production assistant on this particular film, you know? Oh, um, you worked on this film, you didn't do it. Yeah, but I know the director of that, so I'll bring him into my film. This is how he describes it. I'm not making this up. The film commissioner knows this. So I think um, credit and uh, doing things for, um, you know, an IMDb um, credit and, you know, it, it, um, whatever size credit on the film, they're always set out that way. Um, this particular one, the guy, in his compensation section, it lists contingent compensation. In addition to the recitations of valuable consideration above, subject to the production and release of the picture, if it gets released, um, and subject to the performance of director's obligations, director shall be entitled to receive as contingent compensation an amount equal to 3% of 100% of the net profits of the picture, if any, such net profits reducible only by the amount of investor recoupment. Okay, so you see the, the, the levels of how long it's going to take him to get his, you know, it's, um, the net profits, okay, that's netting out all your, after all your expenses. Then, after that, is what? The investor recruitment. After that, it's 3% of whatever's left. So, all right, but it's something, you know? It's, um, and you say if and that, but all right, but you've already got a valuable thing up here. He's getting $400 or whatever it is. Um, he's getting expenses. He's getting credit, there's a separate credit thing. Um, you know, there's a Director's Guild of America that requires certain credits and stuff, so everything's on the up and up, and that's considered valuable in itself. So, you know, you might get some, you hear all the time about um, people trying to get like SAG actors and things like that. Um, I did a talk a couple of years ago comparing all the uh, low budget categories of films that you can have under SAG where they allow you to pay SAG actors a very minimal amount, down to like $100 a day. Still, you know, and there are student films actually less, but um, you know, um, there's like the ultra low budget, the modified low budget, the low budget, and they're all according to how much, like the ultra low budget is like 35,000 or less or something like that. So the film commissioner doesn't even have that as a nat in his law, you know, he just doesn't even, you know, but um, you know, for us, for the independent filmmakers, um, it might make a difference if you've got a guy, person, you know, that you know he's a SAG actor, and for him to be able to, you know, be in this film, you can have SAG and non-SAG, but, you know, for his, you know, for him to be able to do it, he'll agree to do it for a minimal amount, and, of course, that helps your film and all that, so, um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's ways of getting people um, for, you know, even just the experience and the training, there's, there's, there's language you can use for that. I hope I answered yeah. Most of what you were asking there. Good question. Yeah, well, I, well, I have a question kind of building on that, and it relates to, um, well, hiring anyone, specifically actors, as is contract you know, versus salary, I guess, paying mm -hmm. them up front on a contract basis. Or is that, I, I've heard that, you, that there's certain ways that you have to pay 
accurate depending on what the or cast or crew depending on what the position is. Is is there differentiation? In um, you know, for independent for independent films, the, the gentleman asked if there's different ways you can pay actors and other people on the film as far as salary versus upfront payment or you can contract, yeah. yeah you can do whatever you know, the contract would be for you know like a salary at a such and such a day guarantee you know like SAG has all this interesting information that is their standard contract but it's a good idea you know um, guaranteeing them a certain amount of days saying when it starts and when it ends um, so you're committing yourself to hundred dollars a day for those things they have ones like that. You can add an independent one where you know you're doing everything for you know expenses or you know what I mean um, expenses credit a small upfront payment possibly payment down the line. It, the contract will have all those things in it. Now, if you want to just you know as far as this director goes, he got his like two payments of four hundred dollars or whatever it was, and that was it. He didn't get any of the other stuff that was in the contract for him. I mean, he wouldn't automatically get. As we know from this case, he doesn't have a right to anything. So, you know, the later payments, if it gets big, if you get an investor, if you know, a lot of people get paid, he's not going to get that because that's not that he did his, you know, he, from from what anybody can see, you know, without a contract to say any more details, he came in, he directed, he did his full performance, he got his full pay, boom, done, you know. Um, so you could, you know, that that's obviously a way that can be done too. Um, th if this guy would have come in and done just um, his fifteen hundred dollars for his thing and um, done the directing, and, um, you know, then you know, sign that, and then it has a provision for you know the editing. He does his editing, gives it back. That's it. You know, you're done. It's when people object to these things when they try to argue that that's not what we agreed to. You know, that's where it's good to have something in writing, no matter what it is, whether it says you know hundred dollars a day for a minimum of ten days. You know, to do your best in the acting thing, whatever, whatever the requirements. Oh, maybe some of these actor things. I mean, I've I've looked at some of these contracts for people, the poor people. You know, it's and you know you can always like it's not the director's vision. You're going to get fired. But I mean, there's some of them where they wanted you know these people to take these special acting lessons from their guy. It's just ridiculous. So, um, so some of these requirements are, you know, you're a professional actor. You're supposed to do your best job. You're a professional director. You're supposed to do you know, the, up to the standards of whatever is expected in the industry, you know. Um, and so if somebody just does that, gets paid, they're done, you know. It's just when you're trying to defer comp compensation because you think you're going to get, or you're going to get um, some money down the line, if it goes to Sundance, if some guy distributes it, you know, stuff like that. Um, so that's where, you know, I mean, you can, you can pay your upfront thing, you're getting paid this, you don't have any rights in the film, you know, you're a work for hire, they're out of there. It's just when you're trying to induce people to work for not much pay that, oh, you might get something down the line, and da da da, and you're getting credit, and you see, you know, it's it's different forms of payments, but um, the proof of it is is still important, you know. But I thought it was going to be a hundred dollars a day plus expenses. Well, we didn't write anything down, but I only remember doing that. Well, I'll sue you, you know. That's where you don't want to have to hash that out in court the way this poor person did. <laughs>